It's always the best part after the lunch break, I think. It'll bring you out of your stupor, so to speak. And I think uh, there will be some discussions about some of the topics. And when uh, I uh, just talked here a bit with people, I said, I think we are living in curious times. It's 2023, more or less the beginning of the 20s. But they started already quite strangely with a pandemic that we could actually uh, anticipate in theory. But when it came, we were rather unprepared with all the consequences that we're feeling now, fear of inflation and recession and a war in the Ukraine and threatening geopolitical distortions. And we're quite under stress right at the moment. And I noticed that in my everyday practice. As I just said, it, when I was 22 years old, so I started to work with um, uh, companies to see what will be the next 10 years, what will they bring, and what kind of disruptions we will see in the next 10 years. And right at the moment, we have so many different breakthroughs, transformation, rapid changes, and many questions. And we see how complex our world has become and how difficult it is for us as individuals to, to draw conclusions. And this is why I'd like to share with you what we at Future Matters, which is a very small consulting company in the town of Zurich, or city of Zurich, sorry, we're about one dozen scientists and researchers who are looking or researching different areas for, uh, for breakthroughs and uh, transformations. And we have that, we do that every month. And we're not just reading the classical newspapers, but we go to conferences, we look through through patterns. We are participating in forums uh, where there is a discussion of, uh, about new technologies by those who invent them. And if there is no, uh, no disease and anything like that, uh, we actually go to those people who work with the future, like with Mr. Lieber, because we found out that the best way to find out what the future will bring is to talk with people about that who really work on that future, to ask them what kind of obstacles there are that we have to overcome, and what is the dyna dynamics of the development of the technology? Will we see, will we get 1 to 3% better every year or 50% better every year? And then also we would like to determine so-called tipping points where an existing business model or an existing technology may possibly be replaced because the new is always the enemy of the uh, of the old, and what's better is always an enemy of the status quo. We've seen that in the past. And what I'd like to ask you also in those times is there will be some topics might even separate you, where some of you might actually have fit in your pockets because you have an opinion which is not really um, pleasant. And that's the phenomenon of our times. Five years ago and 10 years ago when I was here, we could talk differently about the future. Usually I give a small story that I told someone from the real estate industry. I told him if 20 years ago or 20 years ago, there were two men meeting in a bar desk and as it usually happens you start talking and you talk about things like cars and one of them says hey i just bought a new diesel great thing only five liters per 100 kilometers and the other one said no i would never buy a diesel it's so loud and my neighbors got one and then there's too much of emissions no it's better to have a usual petrol those two men and i say men not because it's a cliche, but it's an idea. So those two men could talk 10 or 20 minutes about that and have a, an argument about that. And after 20 minutes, one said, you know what? You drive your diesel and I will go on with a turbo engine, uh, petrol driven car, but let's have two more beer. Today, if those two people met at, at a bar and they talked about uh, propulsion concepts and one said, yes, I want to have combustion engine. And then the next one says, 
Um, no, I would like to have an e-vehicle, and the next one says, but okay, how about the place, how about the Congo, where you have the uh, commodities, and are you a fan of Greta Thunberg, and so on? This can be a real bar fight in the end. And I don't know if at the end they can sit together and say, okay, you buy your combustion engine, I take my e-vehicle, and let's have another beer. Because the systems have become bigger, because we have to understand how things belong together, and that's so hard to do. All of a sudden, it's not just about uh, the sound of the diesel or the torque or whatever. No, we have to discuss about matters of energy and the existence of future generations, the geopolitical implications. These are very, very big and complex systems. And today, and this is why I'm so happy to be at this conference, today we have to, we should try to take a ride in a helicopter to get a different angle in looking at what we usually want to look at. We have to get out of our everyday overburdening that we see because we just have to kind of get our week done. Now, future research. How does that work? And I would like to add to what Dr. Leber already said because he explained half of it already quite well. And I will now explain uh, the other half with a little story. It's about, well, the, we have to understand the future is not a coincidence and it's not destiny that we can't do anything about, but future is designed. Steve Jobs said when he presented the iPhone in 2007 on the press conference, he told the uh, those who were skeptical and said no one will buy that. They once even less so. And then the Simlock and AT and T and far too expensive. And we have Blackberries and so on. Why should we need that? And he noticed that people couldn't understand the big uh, picture. Why it was not just a phone but a different device for communication. He said, and becomes obvious. You're too late. Yeah, if the trend becomes obvious, you're too late. And we don't have just linear trends that will continue forever, but we very often have these kind of disruptions in trends. And they can either be painful or, from the point of view of an investor, they could be really exciting because many of these trend disruptions are connected to exponential functions. So with uh, chances of growth, growth opportunities and other opportunities which are much bigger than if we just went on the way we did in a linear way. And this point where a new technology achieves or reaches a certain maturity um, or a certain growth, we call it the tipping point, similar to Gladwell who did this for marketing. And the best way to describe that is with popcorn. I think I told you last time, but maybe you have forgotten the story or you're here for the first time. Uh, so I will explain. So the following dilemma. Well, we're through with football, the season is over, but uh, let's just imagine last weekend you had uh, a meeting to watch football together and you prepare everything, your crisps and uh, the avocado sauce and so on, and someone says, hey, five minutes before the the match starts, he says, popcorn, why not popcorn? I would like to have it. So you go to your kitchen and you see a package of popcorn and said, okay, five minutes left till uh, the match begins, but everyone comes to the kitchen and on the, uh, the uh, they, they put some, a little bit of oil in a pot and you need one handful of popcorn for two people, so you put it into the oil, you put the whole pot on the oven, and you switch it on, and you ask your friends, what do you think, how long will it take till we get our popcorn? That's a future prognosis. Not far into the future, but still. And the whole system is already working. So the oven gets warm, the little LED light at uh, the oven says, OK, now the uh, it's getting hot. And you hear the first sound, something like, Doom. And the very 
very excited ones, those who in the de uh, technology diffusion curves or garden hype cycle already say the first time, okay, now it will go on. They said, oh, it starts, it starts after 20 seconds. But what was that sound? It was a, a sign that something happens. It was a little drop of water between the pot and the oven, which became steam. And that this is why it actually hit the whole, uh, it hit the whole pot. But it was a wrong prognosis because there is no popcorn yet. One minute is over, two minutes are over. And you hear that people at, uh, on the TV, um, uh, the, the, the reporter says, oh, now they are meeting, the, the game will soon begin. And then the next one's coming and say, okay, the match is about to begin. I think this will not work. They do a linear prognosis. They take what they saw in the past and project it into the future. And the last minutes, no popcorn, meaning in the next two minutes, there won't be popcorn as well. But the real smart ones of us try to understand the system. And this is what we all are trying to do here. And we are so much better at that meanwhile, because we've got artificial intelligence and we've got the great methods to quickly get the necessary information information in order to have a forecast which is reasonable, logical, and technology-based. So we've got this great device now in version 14. Quite a lot of innovation cycles have already passed. Very inexpensive, available everywhere with 5G, and the knowledge of the world can be tapped on for zero euros. So what's the third person looking at the pot with popcorn is doing? They said, do you have a thermometer? Yeah, I've got that, some meter or some, I don't know. You can put that into the pot to see the temperature of the oil. And now you just need some knowledge of the world, because even if you've never did popcorn like this, you just Google popcorn and you see in Wikipedia, popcorn pops in hot oil at a temperature of about 180 centigrade. And you think, okay, it's only 140 degrees now. And you say, okay, popcorn will pop logically because the popcorn, the corn of the popcorn consists of three different layers, the um, yellow and brown skin, which will end up in between our teeth. Then there is a layer of dried starch very hot, uh, very hard. When you actually uh, bite on it, you can actually break your tooth. And in the middle, there is this little part which, with a little bit of oil and water. And we all know water's got three states. Uh, it's uh, solid when it's below zero. It's liquid until 100 degrees Celsius, and then it will become steam. And as soon as there is steam, the pressure will get higher, and the popcorn will explode, and the steam will diffuse into the, the pores of the still um, humid starch and will blow it up till uh, uh, like styrofoam. So, and if you take this thermometer as a measuring instrument, you can say, oh, now we've reached 150 uh, degrees Celsius and per second it goes up one degree, so 151, 152, 153. And then you can tell people, well, in 30 seconds we'll have our popcorn. And this forecast is more or less true. Maybe there may be a few uh, seconds difference, uh, depends on the height at which you are, 400 meters above zero or 1,000 and so on. And then you can see the first popcorn is popping. And if you don't have a, a lid on your pot, uh, it's uh, you should put it on, because then it will be very quick. Pop, 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 and fast and fast. And within a few seconds, all of them are popping, apart from the few uh, which will never pop. And that's exponential growth. Uh, 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, 32, and so on. That is uh, in a compressed form here. And we usually underestimate the power of exponentiality. And how often have we seen that? We've seen stocks which all of a sudden doubled year on year. And if you have a, a doubling 10 times, that's quite a lot. There's this rich uncle experiment. Now I'm, I'm telling too many stories, but let me quickly do that. I usually tell my children, say, okay, just imagine 
that the, your rich uncle from America is coming and you give him uh, your room so that he can stay there overnight and the rich uncle says, okay, I know uh, now you have given me your bed. I want to give you a bit of money. Either I give you $100 now or I give you to today $1, $2 tomorrow, $4 the next day and I will double it every time for over the 10 days that I will stay here. And some people would say, okay, uh, one, two, four, eight. Mm. But, well, 10 days would be $1,024. And if he uh, stays longer, uh, maybe a month, then we would be a billionaire if he actually would ke keep his promise, of course. But this is just an idea of exponentiality. And now we will start with two things. On the one hand, I want to shock you a bit with trends, which if you think about them, could really make you worry and fear, because for many of these trends, we don't have the right answers and solutions in place. And the second half, or maybe the last third, is uh, filled with a list that we should look forward to when we think of the future. Well, 10 years, 520 weeks short, quite some time. We tend to overestimate what we can do in a short time, but we underestimate what is possible within a decade. Please keep that in mind because trans transformations and disruptions come quicker than we thought. A big super trend, I don't call it a mega trend anymore, it's a super trend, that is what is currently happening with AI. Five years ago, I talked about AI in a joking way under the motto, the end of stupidity. And people started to laugh because I forecasted that um, in the beginning of the 20s, we would come to a tipping point. We cannot describe it, what we call it internally, the end of stupidity, because we're surrounded by stupidity, aren't we? Some of the people at that time laughed and thought of their neighbors or their colleagues and thought of the stupidity of humans. But I was talking about a scenario or a utopia saying that we might have a technology which regarding the level of intelligence, the opportunity to under, the, the possibility to understand things, to analyze them, to help us in our daily work, we would come to the point of parity where the machine can do the same that we have developed over time in our neuronal networks. And that is quite limited, you know, and that time has come now, and we're not laughing anymore. Right at the moment, we're laughing about ChatGPT because we see the mistakes it sometimes makes or it's a bias or whatever, but the spread of ChatGPT is the first, first idea of what will this, what, would it, what will change all societies in the next 100 weeks. Latest study of Oxford two weeks ago, 90% of all stu students and pupils in the, in the United Kingdom use ChatGBT to do their homework or to, to do their studies. And only 10% of parents believe that their children work with that technology. It's quite a good early indicator of how quickly things are evolving. But what are we talking about? Artificial intelligence is in the broad sense, imitating what we humans need to become an intelligent being. We're not equipped right from the beginning with all the knowledge. We're not pre-programmed when we come into being and do what you do every day now. We actually are born with not much pre-programming. If a baby is born, this little human being doesn't know much, quite contrary to a bird, who now in spring is now um, is now hatched in the in the in the nest. They don't have to do a architectural studies to find the right materials to build a known nest and to actually keep the species alive. That is all already pre-programmed, no, but not in our case. So what we do, we first start to open our eyes and we look into faces of people and we see differences. So we start recognizing patterns. We say, okay, oh, this face looks different from the other one. A few months later, we start 
to um, to be afraid of strange persons because we can make this dis distinction. And then we hear something in our ear, but after a while we see it's not just sounds, but they have a significance. Mom, mommy says yum yum, and then I get something to eat. And then we get reinforcement learning when we imitate that in AI. That's what it's called by reward mechanisms. You say, hey, this was a good decision to do that because I get something to eat and a smile in addition. And then we try to we start understanding words. We go to school. We understand the world with open eyes. We see the big patterns. We see the systems that we need. But we are limited by one genetic thing, and that is the intelligence or the possibility of performance of our brain. We can uh, recognize a lot of patterns, but uh, as a certain as of a certain degree of complexity, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of time, sometimes years, if not decades to actually understand some per, uh, some patterns retrospectively. Large language models, and that is what we're talking about right at the moment when we talk about AI, they are based on human language. And that was the big breakthrough, which most people who have been working and researching in artificial intelligence couldn't actually foresee, because it was a side product. Um, we said, let's have an artificial intelligent read a lot. They could not even get access to the internet, but first of all, uh, they had to read books, novels, and technical descriptions, instructions, textbooks, and everything. Then they said, well, see whether you find patterns of people, of how patterns, uh, of how humans use language. And if you use GPT-4, these are words, or well, speech-based outputs, where the K and the AI calculates, the calculates what is the next word that would be logical. So first of all, the, they thought that it was, would, would be interesting for translations or for things that help writing poems or such. But um, it shows that um, actually almost everything that, that we learn and that we use to understand the nature is based on language. And if you think about that, laws. This is language. But we just uh, sat down and said before, well, everybody has their own law, but um, we need to see that we uh, regulate that and we put that in language that so that people understand it. Religions are based on language, that you um, tell stories, that you forward uh, values and ethics. Storytelling is the oldest way of knowledge transfer, and this is also based on language. Even physics, mathemat mathematics is language. <clears throat> and what surprised us a lot is how the AI, how well the AI can deal with that. And ChatGPT4 can today complete studies uh, of, uh, of law um, with 90% uh, best of class. So they're, they're among the top 10. And you know how difficult this is. Uh, so if you have uh, children or maybe no people who have uh, studied four years in order to get there. And, uh, and we're at that point where we can apply this also to medicine, where, where they can uh, find patterns or where, where this is applicable to biology and such. And we see that these systems have come to a tipping point where a law office can say, well, um, if this is about uh, setting up easy contracts and founding a, a new limited or something or uh, increasing equity, then this, uh, that, that this system can do this uh, really fast. So we need to imagine that ChatGPT was published in November last year. These are 30 weeks, and right now we have more than 200 million users on this platform. So it's way faster than each other technology. It's used every day, and it is only the beginning. So and here we're getting to that parity point where we need to say, and I think that is what is what stresses us out as humans. So we knew 
so we, we thought we do so far that we were we are the most intelligent system on the planet that means we knew we're a little smarter than the animals that we hunt so we can use traps we can build things we created culture and laws and architecture and and such we were the crown of intelligence there was nothing but the computers that we had so far they could not help us with uh, what we're good at um, like um, taking decisions understanding complex things um, dealing with all the things that uh, taking that are taking up our time but it also um, brought us to our limits uh, with all that information and communication um, you probably have the same problem as I have. So I use WhatsApp, I use a couple of social media, I have email. Uh, so how often do you uh, do you confirm, well, on WhatsApp, yes, I'm coming on Friday, and you don't put it into your ca calendar, and um, so we receive more information than ever. Lots of it is fake. Lots of it is, uh, has the target to influence us clearly, and ChatGPT or the, the the language models they are great in finding the uh, the the great word, uh, the, the right words and to convince people. And this is a problem. This is a big problem. On the other hand, how do we get out of the rat race in which we are right now? So and and that works really. Fast. So maybe you heard of Copilot from Microsoft. The, uh, Microsoft, around about 20 weeks ago, with around about 20 billion and um, others. So they um, had a, they took up a participation in uh, OpenAI, and uh, they are including it in Office. We now have Office 360. You may pay, might pay 140 euros per year. You have Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and all the other tools, and you are working with those. And ah, uh, uh, there's always things changing. Um, creating PowerPoint presentations that that look good takes up a day or maybe longer, and they are. I'm publishing something and um, building that technology in there, and it's a total revolution. And I'm in, I'm really looking forward to see how, what, what it means with prices, because the old office there, you need to type yourself and design and such, and you have that co-pilot thing with which you can talk in dialogue. So um, you, you talk to, to the co-pilot uh, like to an expert in uh, PowerPoint, Word, Excel, who can create pictures, um, videos, texts, uh, and, and you do that in, in dialogue. And then if, uh, if they'd say it costs 5,000 and not 50, would I buy that? Yes. So, if, so imagine if you have a PowerPoint presentation on which you work two to three days and it still look terrible, you can do that with a dialogue and say, okay, look, we're doing a sales presentation about our funds and we take the, the logo of a company, you find that on the internet, we do a nice introduction, I would like to have a, a quotation about what we're going to do, you're going to find something, then um, you describe the, 20 years of de uh, the, the last 20 years of development and uh, we are um, <coughs> um, having a, a hypothesis that uh, charging infrastructure will boom and so you, you find out what kind of uh, charging stations are most interesting and so you're talking 10 minutes to that uh, device and then it's done you receive emails in the morning and the system says well there um, you have received 40 emails overnight uh, I have responded to them to, to most of them most of them only concern dates or um, they want to have the presentation for others I have prepared you the answer and you I really doubt to you and you say yes or no and they are so nicely formulated that, that your customers might say well that's a really nice person and uh, really great and the same thing with, with Excel you receive a business plan and uh, looks through it and uh, and and you say well something something's wrong writing letters with word well, chat gpt is great uh, you just uh, uh, 
Tell, tell them, uh, write a, a love poem to my wife uh, that does not contain the word love, and tuck, it's done. That's great. But we're not talking about the year 2033, but the year 2023, because this is going to, uh, to be published this year. And the positive thing about it is that in the next years, we'll have the chance that our personal productivity will be incredibly increased if we use that uh, that tool. And a head of research just uh, ye yesterday gave me a nice comparison and said, well, it is like um, if you if you just rode a bike so far and then you uh, use an e-bike, so you you just get get away faster and easier and. Um, so well, you will still need to give the give your ideas to uh, to the, these tools, but you'll get to the result much faster. And this is the the push in production that we have been waiting for for the last twenty years. So um, when we said, okay, well, will through computers uh, the productivity will that arrive? which has been promised to us. And I think it will come in the next 260 weeks. And those uh, who are able to use that correctly, they can um, quadruple their, uh, their, their efficiency. And maybe let's assume you have a, uh, a, a marketing agency, you've got a web designer, a, a graphics designer, someone who can do web optimization, and that's the bad thing about the equation. Two two thirds of them can be laid off, and uh, you can sit down with a client in the evening and say, "Okay, how do how do you want it? Okay, we'll have a dark theme, and then we'll put some text in there, and we'll generate a a picture with a big journey. These that they, they generate uh, pictures that are way better than uh, if you have a photograph of them. Um, that that it will create a text that, that sounds nice, it is optimized for uh, search engines, and then after an hour you're done. This is productivity. And if you do it right, then you have less costs for uh, the people and you have a way higher productivity. When it comes to law firms, it's, it's basically the same. So if uh, uh, you can um, work through lots of more information and you can hope that in the year 2026, and that's not far away, that's 200 weeks, um, a little less, 150 weeks, that you have a digital personal assistant that probably is uh, the most important enhancement to your intelligence that you'll ever have in your life. So it's going to be interesting. So, what is currently summed up under AI, under artificial intelligence, in collaboration with, uh, with individual, we call it to, uh, as we call it augmented intelligence or ambient intelligence. And, uh, uh, let's assume you ha have uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, an intelligence that you can trust. I'm not going to talk about the topic of data protection because we, that, that would need an entire presentation, but that is so close to you that it uh, learns how you work, that uh, monitors you, that helps you when you need help, that helps you to learn faster and understand things faster. And this point will not come in 2023, but it is in 2025, 2026. And it's going to be very interesting who will provide that assistance. But let's just imagine you set yourself targets and say, well, I would like to learn another language. Spanish would be great. And tell your assistant, you know, please teach me Spanish. And that in a way that I like. Um, so, for example, if you um, present something during the, the ride, during the, the drive in the car, you can just put in a Spanish word in there and uh, it will automatically recognize what kind of way of learning suits me best. And um, it will listen to my presentation today and could say, well, Lars, next time you could do two or three things better or you have told, you, you told two or three, three things that uh, are not exactly correct. 
So um, it might be that I that I have a quarrel with uh, my wife or in the family, which we can't get out, and we are arguing and arguing and arguing. And sometimes our personal assistant says, well, actually, you want the same thing. You just have different ways of expressing things. You use different words. Let's try it that way. And if you think about it, what kind of benefit that could be? That we say, well, we have a coach at our side that makes it possible to understand things way faster for things that we need 10 years in, in the retrospective we say well if i had known that 10 years earlier and now we have that so during one life we can probably learn a lot of things we can close our gaps we can um, and, and it's going to really be incredible but how will society deal with it? And that is something that really puts the sweat uh, on my forehead. So we're talking about an incredible uh, disruption in the way that we understand work, human work. Because many of the things that are being done every day is working through algorithms. That means batch. And we use our eyes and ears that we understand language because we hear, hear it or because we see it and we read it and understand uh, the, the contents. And then we uh, begin typing a response with our fingers. And in those next 10 years, we will lose many people a basis that represent a security where they said, okay, for that I can get money, I can build a house, I can uh, pay off my mortgage, and uh, if I lose uh, that job, I'm probably uh, so interesting that I'm going to find a new job quickly. And we see that um, many jobs will just uh, be done 100 times faster and 100 times better uh, by machines in the second half of the 2020s. And we will not get around the fact, this is my personal opinion, that um, we that the value, the added value and the earnings that we have with uh, robotics, that we distribute them to the people, and that we have a taxation system and redistribution system so that if we manage to increase our productivity by 20, 30, 40 percent, especially, uh, which is a challenge, um, especially when it comes to demographic change, then that we have a distribution mechanism of how um, parts of this value addition or production addition that this can be distributed differently. This AI will at the end of uh, this decade, maybe a little earlier, also become physical. That means uh, it's not yet uh, done with it that they can do PowerPoint presentations and emails, then that, that they can only deal with bits and bytes, but that they can also move things. And if we talk about autom autonomous driving, for example, then many of us have a wrong image. So if I talk about manufacturers, OEMs, then I, I hear how long that like five years, ten years, or maybe never. This is something that I, like something that, that this is something that we won't see. Um, I don't know what the is, you are, but um, so if today we are flying over to San Francisco, we can uh, get, take a GM cruise or a Waymo uh, car that drives us through San Francisco without a driver. This is 2023. They have been doing that for one year now. This is, or in Phoenix, Arizona, this is the same thing. Of course, this is um, only in, in limited areas, but um, but here uh, this is still way safer than uh, having a tired tourist uh, driving themselves in a rented car. So, and, and um, artificial intelligence this is about the recognition of patterns. And what we do with uh, with our eyes is, okay, this is a child, this is a, um, this is a zebra, zebra crossing, and uh, and we do prognosis. Then, okay, they will they will stop, and, and it's just, uh, they, they also do. So, a uh, autonomous car is also um, 
Robot also, yeah, this, this is a robot. This is not a robot as we know from Terminator, but it's a robot that drives on four wheels. It is a system that is able to move autonomously through human environments. Uh, and uh, each and everyone who tells me that in Germany we should, uh, or in, in Europe we should uh, foster the automotive industry so that it's uh, be as big in 2029 as it is in 2019. Um, they uh, overlook the biggest chances. In the year 2023, we estimate that the market for robotics will be about three or four times as big as global automotive industry, the pure volume, I mean, or sales. We will build robots for anything, for supply vehicles, which automatically deliver packages or small robots helping supermarkets to carry things to the home of customers. Uh, we also will have uh, robots, nursing robots, which will help us because we will all end up in a situation where we need nursing helping us in that, for instance. And uh, there we get probably uh, nursing and care, which will be better than the, what the human level could actually bring us. What we also have to see is that when we wait longer with AI, with uh, that we have to see that uh, the Chinese or the Americans um, will um, do something about that, then the trend becomes obvious, so we are too late. Although everyone here in Germany would have the chance to do that, it's not even energy intense. We, the only thing where we need energy is in thinking. We have to uh, have ideas and find people financing us, believing with us in the things that we develop and seeing the cycles that we've seen today. But we will reach a point where it will become really interesting. And we can also see that the energy system is changing. It's not a question of if, because logic tells us now after 200 years of use of fossil fuels and a clear effect on the climate plus the use of a finite and, and uh, hazardous resource, we will change to a renewable energy system. Everyone who says that doesn't make sense or is not possible is unlogical. We've got enough energy, 12,000 times more energy do we have right at the moment by the fusion reactor that we have in the sky, fortunately far enough away so that it will not burn us, but close enough to give us the season. The sun, and the sun gives us light and ultraviolet radiation and gives 12 times more energy to the Earth than what we can produce in all three sectors for mobility, for power generation and generation of heat and cold. So we just need to do a little bit right, become resilient. And when you look at it from a helicopter perspective in the end, does it really make sense or it really makes, does it really make sense to say, yeah, we will actually actually import fossil fuels from some uh, countries which are just waste because we uh, import a few cubic meters of gas and we burn it and it's gone and we have to do it again. So we import waste product which have a, a bad influence on our future. So we could better do it here on site. The energy system, you have to think big and artificial intelligence can help us do so to better understand this because, and that's the strange thing in KI, or the crazy thing. Uh, some say, uh, AIDS great, I want it, and others said, please, I don't want that. I think we will need it in the end because we have big and bigger problems and challenges, and the um, we have to have the uh, entrepreneurial foresight. We need it. Uh, the energy system that we have right now can be easily transformed into a breathing energy system if we manage to use the right storage, if be it hydrogen or vehicles or stationary um, batteries, now we come to a new point where the transfer of energy can be made so much better that we will have uh, grids which can be global meanwhile because there's uh, the, we've got a high voltage and equal currents on direct currents on um, we have already put a whole network around the world with the internet we could do the same with energy and all of a sudden transmissions of over 10,000 kilometers and the earth is 40,000 kilometers um, and, and half of them is 20,000 because on one side of the earth it's always dark and cold and on the other side it's hot and 
And if we just uh, do this grid, we could easily manage with the energy supply. This is all possible to plan, but it's far too complex for one person or for one environment or for, an, for a minister, even for a minister of finance and for those people who want to get their opinion from the yellow press. But in the end, it's feasible if we work with bigger and more complex systems. That brings me to the last point, because I think we have to start our discussion. Uh, there's a list of things that we should look forward to in the future. That's what I, uh, that I, I set that up yesterday with our head of research. So where does it lead to? And that shows a whole bunch of different opportunities that we often forget today in our stressful time with too much information. The 2020s are an enormous playground for people who are in, able to think big and think far and forget about the status quo in their mind and rather think about utopias and then think about realizing them. One thing is, Healthcare and care for old, older people will be much more inexpensive and much more um, humane, humane and with less shaming if we allow AI and robotics in our nursing. When you have dementia and you have a, um, or you have AD, then you have a robot which will spend several hours a day to build up our synapses so we can remember who we are, what we are, great thing. And uh, also overcome restrictions of mobility so we can stay longer at home or where we want to be could also stay if you decide to go to Norway and do that, it would be possible, even with the language issue. And it will be a huge market for um, uh, nursing care and old age pension in, in the uh, field of AI and robotics, also under the impression of the demographic situation we have right now. In medicine, we've achieved some progress, which will make us think that in the next 10 years, we will be able that 80% of the currently fatal diseases can be cured. And the good news is, if you manage to live till 2035, you'll have a, a, a high chance to become more than 100 years old. So maybe it's a good intention for the next uh, 10 or 12 years to actually uh, keep your health up. It's not possible today, but if you live till 2035, there's a high likelihood that you will be uh, celebrate your 100th birthday. Now, Professor Fell just told us how, how bad our uh, bureaucracy is. That's a huge challenge, of course, but in theory, it would be easy. I just talked to an architect recently who told me now what is possible to, when you design a house. He's got a big iPad and we just played with it. We had a property and uh, we just took it from Google Maps and then we actually played a bit and, and built a house. After one hour, we were finished. He was able to, uh, to generate a digital twin of the house with all the blueprints, with the uh, volumes, with the statics, with all electric outlets, with the uh, empty tubes that you need for the uh, cables and communication and so on. And in theory, in two years' time, it will be possible to just pull, push one button and then you have a finished um, application for building permit and send it to the authority. And in theory, if the authorities use AI as well, uh, then 10 minutes later, you could actually get your uh, building permit. But OK, these are things we have to work on, of course. I think that many things become more inexpensive in our daily life. And I think that if we think more in long term, power and energy will become much more inexpensive than right at the moment. It's not a natural law where we say it will become more and more expensive. No, we can see that in the sun, uh, sunny areas when we use photovoltaic, um, we can generate power for one or two cents per kilowatt hour. And this is without subsidies. 
And it's quite clear that, of course, you have to pay for the grid, but you don't have to pay for the CO2 that you emit. And we have to see how to transport that kind of power. And it would be much better to do that with electric pipelines that is high voltage instead of transforming it into ammonium and hydrogen and then put it back and convert it back into power. Um, hydrogen will, of course, have its place, but probably not as big as some people think today because there are a few applications where it's good for, but there's quite a lot of other areas where um, power generation, hydrogen, just remember one thing, the past 30 years, well, the age of digitalization, and now we have to electrify everything that's energy. So what we did with fuel, fossil fuels before, with gas before, it's a simple form of electrification, easier to spread and easier to store, and, and with better efficiency and uh, higher efficacy, uh, uh, effectiveness. And we will see that soon. We will soon. We will soon come to the tipping point that will be in 2025, in about 100 weeks time, where in all kinds of vehicles, the electric drive will be cheaper than a fossil fuel drive in 2025. And that also includes vans, transporters, trucks, lorries, and it will not be uh, the environmental protection officer who orders an e-vehicle, but it will be the controller because he knows it's cheaper. Uh, now, reach and charging times, I can tell you from my own experience, will not pose an issue because I have about 500,000 kilometers driven electrically and I was never late and I drive 70,000 kilometers every year. So that's the mileage I have. So it's interesting that so many people tell me that it's not possible without having any experience. So if you want to form your opinion, please try it out yourself. That's the only thing. Um, flights within Germany or Europe will be electrically driven as of 2030, so that will be feasible at least. Um, we, uh, the technology is just overcoming the hurdle of 400 to 500 watt hours per kilogram, which means that we can operate airplanes with or aircrafts with um, for about two and three hours purely electrically. Um, then we have to see about the access towards the airport. So everyone who thinks flying is a matter of the past, no. There's a transformation going on, and it will become much more environmentally friendly. And even it's it, the sound is less because our sound um, pollution is less because it's electrically driven much uh, much less uh, sound. And if you look at what companies get what funding and what they do, you will see that. And two more things, we will have less advertising in the future, all this old principle that you just have to shoot advertising at you all the time until you buy the product. Uh, very soon our personal assistant will do that. So our personal assistant will uh, look for the best flight for us for the product that we need right at the moment. And it will be quite interesting to see how you advertise something to a personal assistant. And the last point, and with that I would like to close and open the discussion is, a huge field which is currently underestimated in the whole megatrend industry is the food production of the future. Look into the way how in the future we will put plants. Of course, there is also genetic engineering, but also how we can build up plants and in dairy products, in plant-based products, and in protein-based products that we see right at the moment as meat, all those sectors will have huge transformations. Plant-based meat, in vitro meat, will have a higher quality than what we usually eat because it's free of hormones, it's more yummy, it's healthier, and there will be meat sorts uh, like possible food sets uh, doing that for which there is no animal. For instance, when you go when you are in the states and you go to Impossible Foods, there is one meat type of meat which uh, is tender like chicken tastes like beef and has a texture like pork, but there's no animal that can produce this. So the texture and the taste can be done. Vertical farming 
It is uh, becoming more and more interesting for countries under a draft um, because in that case you can uh, produce over 365 days a year high value biological products with good quality. We just talked about protein folding before. Uh, the company Remilk, an uh, Israeli startup, meanwhile quite big in these days, is just building up a new dairy um, factory in Denmark with a footprint of twice this room which we are in. And this dairy company can produce the equivalent of cow milk because they did some research of the udder of a cow to see what is needed to produce milk. And they've got microorganisms and fermenting uh, methods that they develop with, so that with microorganisms, they can do the same thing as what happens in the cow and you get milk. On a pasture, which is twice as much space as this room here, you can have an equivalent of 50,000 cows and the milk tastes like milk, costs only half as much and for one liter, it costs only five liters for producing one liter milk. In a cow, you need 700. That's the methane problem which is solved. And we are not talking about 2033, 20, but 2023, they will produce their first products at the end of this year. And the first sector where we thought must always be in the open sky and always with animals and always on a pasture, all this will be disrupted totally. That brings me to the end of my little beautiful, so to speak, in the near future, or my little excursion into the near future. I think we sometimes have to look up to see in what a paradise we're living with our freedom, with our great climate that we still have, with the opportunity to invest and help people with their good ideas to improve the world. And with this many, many, many disruptive opportunities to change the world. Industries that have been the same for centuries can now change quickly, and that opens up huge chances. And we need AI. It needs to help us reduce the stress level that we have just by trying to cope with the complexity with our own brain. What we have to do is we have to invite the AI to help us to understand the better, the, the, the greater, uh, Thank you. Looking at the watch, we have three or four minutes. That's two or three questions. No advertising needed in the future. Isn't that really bad for the TV? channels. Uh, Thompson, well, uh, my, 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 my Mr. Thompson, in my view, you have left out a few important factors you have to deal with in the next years, decades, maybe centuries. And that will be as influential on for our life as all the technical outlook that you have given us. For instance, what about the educational system? What about organized crime? What about national nationality and, and uh, rule of law? The other thing I found a bit disturbing is a colleague of you, a famous colleague of yours who was unfortunately deceased. He wrote a little book, The Working Day of an American Journalist, in the year 2889. That's a very long horizon, I would say. Average uh, industrial company has a planning horizon of about 10 years. Nuclear power stations that will now uh, be opened will be switched off in 60 years. And in 22 years, we won't have any combustion engines anymore. We're not supposed to have any. Don't you think a forecast of 10 years is a bit too less? It's rather a bit silly. Uh, thank you, silly. Well, I don't know. I have to openly admit, 10 years ago, it was easier to talk about the next 10 years because many of those things were still uh, utopia in the positive sense of that word. So for one hour, we just started to imagine something in, in our minds and thought, is that a good idea? And that's an important criterion for investments, of course. When I can imagine that helps, that this helps my life, then you can probably uh, rather say, okay, I'll invest in that, in that idea. Now we're in a time of transformation, which makes it difficult even for me to always think two years ahead. I talked of AI and the kind of galloping progress that it has seen in the past 20 to 30 weeks. 
That's really huge. And when I uh, take that speed up, then I will not be able to forecast more than two or three years. But there are other people who try to think 100 or 200 years ago. There's a long now foundation in San Francisco with very famous um, boards, um, uh, boards consisting of famous people, I would rather say. But what's why I take the 10 years period is because this is what we can design, no matter if we have the money and use the money for this, or we talk to people and help them to do this. And we do that also in a democracy with our elections. And in my view, this is something which is often forgotten. So when I hear what we're talking about in the media right at the moment, in public discussions and also on many conferences, very often it's about the now and here or the far future. And 10 years, that's 520 Fridays like ours today. That's not much. And in one week, you cannot do much, and this whole discussion has to be triggered. And I'm not saying that everything I'm saying here will come true, but we've got 150 smart people in this room here, and online another 500. And when you actually make these brains think, there will be an outcome. I think we never, ever faced a bigger task as humanity to design the future and set the framework in, for the situation we will live in in the future and also show the limits of technology and think about the ethical question.